dear friends, uh, super nice uh, to see you all at our session. I should uh, we um, uh, the the, uh, the host of the session is speaking the Pobruin. Um, and we were invited by the Arctic uh, Art Summit to do a session about the Russian perspectives. You don't find any session about, you know, the uh, um, uh, uh, Icelandic perspective or the Sami perspective, but you do find a session about Russia. So Russia is this big elephant in the room that everyone wants to, uh, to know about, I guess. That was the reason behind. But anyway, who but not Pekin and Pobruin uh, will be doing the session about the Russia since, uh, you know, we've been working with both Russian and um, uh, Norwegian artists for for almost 20 years uh, uh, in our staff. We are Russians and Norwegians and not uh, uh, only. Uh, and we are based also at the very border between Russia and Norway. So maybe this session will also be a kind of a revisit for ourselves as well and for you all. Uh, so what we actually are doing in the Arctic, in the Russian part uh, uh, of the Arctic, especially that the Arctic is now being redefined um, uh, as a result of the new wave of urbanization, industrialization, securitization and, and the like. And we want to open the session with two um, presentations that will place us geographically in the Russian Arctic. Sort of two poles of the Russian Arctic. Uh, we have Norilsk, here on your side. We have Norilsk on the Taimyr Peninsula, a company town uh, in the severe conditions of permafrost. And we have Murmansk on the Kula Peninsula, which is maybe a comfortable Arctic compared to the Taimir, um, with its ice-free open uh, harbor due to the uh, Gulf Stream. Both cities are very important points uh, uh, with regards to the northern uh, sea route, uh, allowing for a year-round navigation, especially navigation of the strategic resources, but quite big significances, uh, uh, different, significant differences. Norilsk quite isolated with only air connection and very much open uh, Murmansk and integrated with at least Scandinavia. So we start with uh, Natalia Fidyanina, who has just taken the responsibility of uh, director of the Norilsk Museum, and she will present cultural strategies of, for the Arctic Norilsk based on her many years' experience uh, with different, uh, also with living and working uh, in the Norilsk um, uh, in different capacities, in different organizations. Uh, and then we will give the floor to Alexei Platonov and Francesco Sebregonzi, who are just uh, finishing their uh, uh, graduate program, uh, postgraduate program, The New Normal at the Strelka Institute for Media, Architecture and Design in Moscow, or who will present the Murmansk case, sort of a visionary um, uh, case for Murmansk as a result of a teamwork and the field research in Murmansk in March um, uh, this year. So, Natalia, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Luba. Many thanks to you and the organizers uh, for the opportunity to participate in their first summit. I really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, so, I came from Narisk, uh, uh, where I have been living and working for 12 years already. It's uh, on the peninsula of Taimir, which is the uh, uh, northernmost point of uh, Eurasia, not only from Ru of Russia. Uh, uh, Narisk is uh, 300 kilometers behind the Arctic Circle, and uh, it's one of the coldest cities on the planet. <laughs> Much colder uh, than, for example, Murmansk, um, located at the same latitude. Uh, our winter lasts for nine months. Uh, the common temperature in winter is at about 40 degrees below. Um, so uh, there is no, not even a weak uh, uh, breeze of the Gulf Stream. <laughs> um, but uh, at the same time, um, this, uh, the city is rather big, uh, and uh, there are uh, 180,000 uh, people in our city. Uh, and uh, uh, other, other people uh, ask us uh, how and uh, why we live in such a harsh place. Uh, but it's not uh, a question for me, it's a conscious uh, 
uh, it's a conscious choice um, because uh, it's convenient to live there. For example, to work uh, in their museum, it's uh, our main building uh, of their Narisk Museum. Uh, but uh, of course, Narisk, first of all, is uh, an industrial city. Uh, even judging uh, by the brief description of our section, uh, the Arctic is defined and redefined uh, within the strategy of exclusively industrialization. The Arctic is equal uh, to industrialization. Uh, do you know what is the most common uh, combina word combination with the word Arctic, at least in Russian? Uh, it is Arctic development. Uh, in sense of mastering, uh, conquering, overcoming, exploiting. Uh, for many years till our days, uh, the attitude of humans to the Arctic uh, has been shaped uh, in, the, in this logic, in this logic of um, industrial developing, but the climate is changing. And it's time to warm up, uh, warm up uh, in relationships between humans and Arctic. Much has been mastered. It's time to settle. Um, and people in Arctic, what are we, uh, how can culture and art can influence our relationship with uh, the place with the Arctic? I would like to, propo uh, to propose our vision of the directions of changing attitudes toward the Arctic as a territory of presence, as a place of life. <laughs> Um, what is Arctic uh, uh, for people now? This is in the left column and what it can or should become uh, in the future our perspectives, it's uh, in the right column. So from industrializations, uh, industrialization to lifestyle, not purpose or aim, but the process, not feat or heroism, but life itself, not the final exhaustible project, uh, both for cities and for people, but a step, a stage in only one stage in a career, uh, not necessity or compulsion, but a conscious choice, not watch, but whom. And people that live here, they are not heroes, I'm not a hero, um, they are mobile, uh, professionals with relevant uh, interests, aspirations, motivation. Uh, from this point of view, uh, Arctic Art has a special role. Uh, it consists in the formation, awareness, uh, reflection of a new relationship with uh, the place, with the Arctic. Cultural strategies, so, uh, strategies should work to ensure a high quality of life, to serve human development, and culture should uh, provide all opportunities for impressions and ent uh, entertainment, internal growth, lifelong education. No changes in the way uh, of life, no hardship or isolation from the possibilities of life-friendly places. Uh, it's uh, ideally, of course. Um, um, this is the painting um, of Russian artist Pavel Polanski. He brings to absurdity the idea of developing the Arctic. For example, he put uh, beaches with girls in bikinis uh, near the oil-producing uh, stations in the Arctic. Uh, such in his opinion are signs of uh, civilization in our time to enjoy life and consumption through the harsh natural uh, conditions despite the absurdity of the situation. Um, I will give some uh, examples of my Narisk projects uh, that support the cultural strategy forming new uh, relations with the place. Oh, Pavel Polanski and Pavel Polanski. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, the, the one project, uh, New Mythology, the ethnic festival of winter meeting uh, in Taimir, Big Argish. Completely fiction, artificial construction. All the north and Taimir also, uh, mm, people traditionally meet the sun and spring. Uh, but uh, now we meet uh, winter too, with a big, big holiday. We took as a basis the idea of wisdom of indigenous people, uh, for whom winter is also a good uh, time, and the slogan of the project, winter is good. Um, so, Narisk uh, for time becomes a great nomad. Uh, hundreds of indigenous people come from Tundra, uh, thousands of our town people uh, come and participate. So, Taimir meets its harsh winter with a great holiday. We change attitudes to circumstances. Um, 
Lifelong Education Project Club and Lectorium Concentrating Factory. Uh, outstanding people from uh, different areas have come to Narisk and talked about the best practices, the development of science, cities, society, about future. Uh, this is a project for adults who are eager to develop themselves, the possibility to continue training in a distant city, in a remote city as Narisk. Uh, uh, the project uh, yes, it's a much humor project. Uh, Promart, uh, it's a synthesis of a huge Narisk industry and local art. Uh, allows you to look at industriality, uh, on the other hand, to learn you about Narisk um, and to be surprised and smile, of course. Uh, it's uh, one of the actions uh, uh, in the framework of this project, Promart. Uh, excavate the painting. Uh, who drew his uh, self-portrait in Russian auto-portrait. Uh, uh, he drew with his bucket and uh, cut the pillars. Uh, this is the result of his uh, activity. <laughs> so it was, uh, it wa was other actions, uh, underground concert for miners, um, sewn on the gas pipeline in Tundra in winter and so on, very many. Uh, the best uh, uh, social project of the year in Russia in uh, 2012, uh, the ecological action so in Norilsk, uh, when hundreds of people came out to plant the city, their yards and streets, uh, if we couldn't make the city of gardens, we made the city of lawns. Now, this is a story about uh, the social connections, uh, high social capital in Norilsk. Map of new lawns made by people. Um, the result, one of results. Of course, projects are good, but the infrastructure um, more reliable, perspective, promising since January 2016. I have been a director of Narisk Museum. Uh, uh, the museum, or the new strategy of the museum, museum of such a remote place, uh, is to become a media and uh, Forum for local community and, uh, of course, the main institution of social memory. Uh, the memory that uh, disappears very fast in such, uh, in such place uh, with change in population. Uh, museum connects the local mobile communities scattered in, team, uh, in time and space. Some pictures from our museum actions. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, the art vision helps us very much. Last year we opened the museum uh, Polar Art Residence, Polart, um, and invited artists and curators to dream about uh, the future of Norilsk. Um, uh, some of our of my team, <laughs> not not uh, not a big part. Um, for many years, our museum was called the Museum of the History of Development of the Narisk Industrial District. Awful name. <laughs> Today, uh, it's uh, uh, simple. Narisk Museum, from production and development to the city, community, and people in the north. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you. Now, Alexei and, uh, and Francesco, the floor is yours. If you want to watch it, it's there. It's the second one, if you want. Hello. Oh, okay. <coughs> it's just for recording. But there is something going on here. Bon. Is that okay yeah. or Think you can live with it? All right. We can see you. So, um, again, thank you very much for having us. It's a great opportunity for us to, to present this work in progress, project in the making, in this most relevant context of the first Arctic Art Summit. Um, actually, maybe I can do it, don't worry. Um, we are a multidisciplinary team composed of uh, Alexei Platonov, filmmaker, myself, Francesco Sebregondi, I'm an architect, 
and also uh, journalist Ina Pokazanieva and media artist Ilda Yakubov. And we are developing this project in the framework. Can you speak louder? Yes. Okay. Is it better now? Yeah. Okay, I'll try to speak like that. Um, so we're developing this, pro this project in the framework of this program that Luba kindly introduced, uh, the new normal at Strelka Institute in Moscow. It's a program of speculative urbanism, um, which sets out to conceive and imagine um, the implications of ongoing technological leaps uh, for urban and territorial conditions to come. We, we're kind of examining questions like what kind of spaces, what kind of environments do we want to inhabit in the near future and who are we going to share it with um, or what are we going to share it with. So the project that we're developing, Sever, started with a field trip to Murmansk organized within the program um, as a place from which to ground our imagination of an Arctic landscape that is on the course of radical transformations. Uh, due to the expectable drastic effects of climate change in the region. We're projecting ourselves over like a two or three decades ahead horizon, right? So um, to us, this trip really conveyed the idea of a frontier, of an edge condition of the world as we know it, both geographically and historically, on a place on the verge of deep transformations, which was fascinating, but also gripping uh, we, we saw firsthand the kind of anxiety of the people uh, in movements for, uh, that are eager for a change to, to, to come. Um, we, we, we saw the skepticism as well with regards to um, the big plans loudly announced by Russian central government. Uh, we saw the gap between the sort of vision that we uh, hear of while based in Moscow and the kind of uh, reality on the ground of this marginal region that uh, is to become a new center. So something is truly at stake there. Um, and rather than being the main site of our project, um, the Murmansk is the place from which we are looking at the Arctic as a wall. So our project, Sever, is uh, an exercise in speculation, in imagination, but that we understand as an actual valuable political tool, uh, perhaps one of the most valuable we have at our disposal today to imagine alternative futures to the ones already on the horizon if the old colonial formulas of reckless exploitation and short-term interests are allowed to go ahead and to pursue their course. So we're imagining nothing short of a long-term pan-Arctic sustainable and responsible development strategy which revolves around the introduction of a new location-based digital currency. And now we'll play a short clip, which is really a kind of work in progress, but hopefully to introduce some of the main ideas. Oops, no, uh, we need to switch to this. Uh... <laughs> Арктика, как всеобщее достояние, объединяющее доли исходного капитала. Север – это ворота в блокчейн Арктика, где расцветает новое поколение глобальных индустрий. Единая распределенная инфраструктура для прозрачной и ответственной арктической экономики. Север – это больше, чем финансовая стратегия. Это инструмент управления, сдвигающий силу принятия решений сообщества владельцев токена. Возможность увидеть будущее Арктики как общее будущее, построенное и управляемое многим.
Exactly. Oops. Um, okay, so just a few more words, and then I'll, we can discuss this. Um, so for those that are not familiar with blockchain technology, I'll just give you a quick one-on-one. -on -one. It's the digital infrastructure behind Bitcoins and Ethereums, for so those that maybe have heard of it. It's a distributed public ledger maintained by a peer-to-peer network in which all users maintain a copy of the whole chain of data and transaction that went through the network. And it enables basically a network of users to self-organize and achieve forms of consensus at very large scale without middlemen. So the blockchain world is undergoing rapid development right now. In particular, it's becoming a real tool for large-scale crowdfunding um, because it's uh, somehow of community-initiated project. It sets rule in stone, or rather in code, uh, about how exactly funds can be used, so it kind of facilitates um, yeah, this aggregation of initial capital for community-driven projects. Uh, and we, we recognize a kind of alignment between the fact that from logistics to energy, through data management to mining or fishing, it's the same industries that are starting to reconfigure their operations around blockchain technology, which are the, uh, the ones that are most likely to benefit from an open Arctic and that can contribute the most to uh, its economy. So, uh, okay, well, I won't take you through the economics of it, but there is, there is, a, there is a real thought behind, which is essentially this location-based protocol, which increases the value of your tokens based on the latitude, is an incentive to move capital north, but it's also an incentive to, for this capital to be in a distributed form rather than monopolies that uh, control uh, everything. And so, because any, what anybody can buy in according to their means, it, yeah, it encourages this form of distributed capital. Um, but Sever is also designed to bring about a shift not only in economics, but also in, in, in forms of governance. Uh, it's a digital infrastructure for both crowdfunding and crowd wisdom, in as much as token holders acquire decision-making power about how this capital is to be invested. Um, so, yeah, in that sense, Sever is meant to support forms of decentralized governance across a vast community that extends across the circumpolar region and beyond. Uh, so, as we were saying in this film, a territory built and run by the many. And just to conclude, yes, it is very speculative, very imaginative, very ambitious. It requires a lot of imagination to, to think of a future of the Arctic like this. But we think this is precisely what the arts can contribute to uh, the kind of urgent problems of our times. So rather than approaching the Arctic as this vulnerable, marginal area of the world in need of protection and conservation, you know, in this project we imagine the Arctic as a frontier where the future can be incubated, where another, better model of global society has a chance to be built on the right ground. And so that's a project that tries to kickstart this. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> and I ask uh, Alexei, Francesco, and Natalia to stay with us. And uh, I'm inviting here Anton Shapshin, music producer from Murmansk, to join the stage. Not these two. Here we have uh, for the guys who need translation. <gasps> And I invite uh, Vasily Pankratov, the director of the Gatchina Museum Reserve. Um, uh, Vasily also used to be the head of the um, Culture Committee of St. Petersburg. So he is both a practitioner and a policy maker. And we have uh, Stepanida Borisova, uh, whose uh, masterful voice you could you we all were able to enjoy yesterday at the opening uh, of our um, uh, dinner an actress and a singer from Yakutia and I want to start our um, uh, discussion with maybe you know uh, starting off I'm sorry and we yeah I'm sorry <gasps> How come? You know, I, I, I counted you guys uh, as, 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 as one. <laughs> Can you please take that chair? <laughs> and we have Yelena Titova, who is the director of the uh, decorative arts or applied arts uh, in Moscow. 
Is it okay? Yeah, if, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, da, 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 все там есть. And I would like to start to uh, sort of bounce, uh, uh, to start our discussion with uh, basically uh, Anton Yu. Now you've seen the projected history, or history, projected uh, also future story of Murmansk. Do you, how do you see yourself in that future? Yes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Sorry for this technicality. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, I will speak in Russian. I think it's uh, uh, quite nice to have uh, uh, Russian language a little bit, maybe. So, let's start. Um, я думал над вопросом, uh, как, uh, как uh, мы, мы, как мы вписаны uh, вообще в, в историю uh, арктической культуры, и пришел... Uh, у меня не было сомнения о том, что мы в нее вписаны, мы, мы часть. Uh, Arctic culture in Murmansk. No, it's 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 much better that you speak in the microphone because he ah, needs okay. to record, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So for me, it was only a question of uh, what place uh, do we take in the Arctic culture, and I think we take a very uh, advantageous place. So and on the on the one hand we are part uh, of a of an empire and whose culture has established itself uh, uh, globally and uh, when i say empire i don't uh, mean anything bad i think empires can actually be good sometimes but and on the other hand we have uh, two borders uh, with uh, norway and finland so, and it's our direct access to Europe. So, and of course, they will, we have had, we are having, and we will have cultural processes. And, uh, and this, are, this is unavoidable. And, uh, and all of that only uh, strengthens our position as a strategic Arctic region. So, so, and if we use those tools, knowledge, and expertise, uh, uh, on the one hand, with uh, interfacing with the uh, central government uh, in Moscow, and on the other hand, uh, interfacing with uh, across the border, uh, we it will of course uh, bring results, and uh, but and results may be different, but and they uh, and they will be seen in the future. And, and talking on the individual level, talking about uh, artists, uh, performers, so, uh, uh, musicians uh, that uh, live in Murmansk now. Uh, even though we are experiencing, we are seeing uh, quite a large outflow of uh, young creative people. Uh, nevertheless, we have uh, the expertise and the skills uh, uh, to take a certain position, to take a certain place in the Arctic culture. 
Uh, the only thing that bothers me is that we are losing out to competition. And, and the reason for that is very simple. Uh, we lack funding. And we only have enough funding to support the infrastructure, but there is no funding to develop it. So these are my current thoughts, and let's see what happens next. And let's hope that the new, the new digital currency, the, the saver currency, will maybe help to capitalize and, you know, move, move forward the infrastructure and um, both uh, physical and symbolic infrastructure of, of, uh, of Murmansk here. <laughs> Go blockchain. <laughs> well, our, um, you know, Gref, uh, the Sber our Sberbank man, uh, he has already started, you know, playing around with, uh, with, uh, with blockchain. So we will see. <laughs> we will see. Um, I would like to um, uh, turn um, our... So now we've been Murmansk Norilsk. I would like you now to geographically move a little bit towards the... Uh, some latitudes down to St. Petersburg. When we speak about Russia and even beyond Russia, we always refer to St. Petersburg as being the northern capital of the Russian Arctic. Uh, you know, the Museum of Ant Arctic and Antarctic uh, is located in St. Petersburg. All the uh, um, expeditions to the North Pole and to the Arctic, they would have a the, la the last or the next to the last stop in St. Petersburg. Uh, St. Petersburg is boasting with their white knights, but we know that they're black knights compared <laughs> to, to ours. But anyway, so my question to um, um, uh, Vasily, um, how much uh, uh, the Arctic or the Northern Dimension is part of the identity as St. Petersburg? I defines it yeah. for itself. Well, uh, it's a very interesting and difficult question. You know, St. Petersburg is, um, um, is a very complicated phenomenon with very diverse culture. I would say it's mm. a universal city and it, it's uh, very solid, you know, and important for itself. Uh, but indeed, it was uh, founded uh, in the area which is really, definitely, the north. Yeah, and it was founded from the north. You know that Peter the Great who came uh, to this place uh, to found the city, he came from the north, from the, from the White Sea, through Karelia, through Ladoga Lake, Onega Lake, to the small uh, island to found the, the city in the middle of nowhere, uh, considering it as the north. Uh, the first idea of this city was very Nordic, was very Scandinavian. If you, uh, if you um, look at the plan of St. Petersburg, you will find uh, Viking um, characters in the cities, like um, the stronghold, which is uh, founded on an island, uh, which uh, stops the way into the inner waters. This is very Viking idea of the city, like Stockholm, like, like many other Viking cities. But, uh, Later on, this Nordic character was lost, I would say. Uh, St. Petersburg was very much influenced by Italian and French culture. For example, the museum which I now represent, uh, this is a very big palace in the suburbs of St. Petersburg, which is actually a French, French uh, palace, uh, and it has nothing to do with Nordic culture. Um, although, uh, the atmosphere changed a little bit in, in early 20th century and we can see some traits of the Nordic influence in the cultural atmosphere of the city. It's still uh, much more uh, the western rather than northern city. Um, but the, if we talk about today, for example, if I take into consideration my, um, uh, my experience as part of the city administration, I can say that uh, um, there are two major ideas which now dominate uh, or influence on the, on the cultural life uh, in St. Petersburg, uh, which uh, 
make its cultural identity, I would say. So the first idea which appeared in the 90s of the last century uh, call, is called uh, St. Petersburg is the cultural capital of Russia. Uh, it means that Moscow is something like political and culture, all culture is in St. Petersburg. Uh, the other idea which is uh, still very important is uh, comes from the 19th century, but it means that um, St. Petersburg is a window to the west, to the west, not to the north, but to the west. And uh, the northern culture, which is the third idea, is not that popular, I would say. So these two ideas still dominate and they influence more and more. Uh, uh, for example, if I talk about my activities as head of uh, cultural uh, department in St. Petersburg, I would say that only uh, probably uh, some small percentage of of the um, uh, of the plans and funds as well went to uh, into the north direction. Uh, we had very quite good connections. Talking about the Russia, we had quite good connections uh, with Ikutia, for example. Yes, with uh, uh, with Arkhangelsk region, uh, with Karelia. Um, and probably only two major things uh, which were funded uh, from year to year uh, was uh, quite a big festival in southern Arkhangelsk, which is called uh, the uh, in Solvichigotsk, you know. And uh, a festival which is, has to be said, a special festival which is called the Northern Flowers, uh, which is, has its headquarters in St. Petersburg, but it's focused on the north. Uh, both on the Russian north mm. and it's on, yeah, uh, for Europe. example, in Norway, uh, it was part of this festival in Norway some three years ago as well, coming from and funded by St. Petersburg, because part of the budget of St. Petersburg, which is not that uh, big, but we are not, a, you know, a, not a poor city, I would say, of course, <laughs> yeah. So part of the budget goes on promoting St. Petersburg culture every way around. So, uh, to conclude, I would say that uh, the focus on the North today uh, is, I would say, diminishly small, but potentially it's still there. Mm. Uh, but what I would, I would suggest, I would say that we should not uh, consider St. Petersburg as just a city. We should cons consider St. Petersburg as part of the area uh, which we sometimes call mm -hmm. Leningrad region. Yeah. And if we talk about the region, then it is the north. Yeah. It is the north. It's north in terms of nature. It's now north in terms of culture mm -hmm. because many communities still live there which belong to the northern communities. I talk about in German lands, for example, yeah. uh, which has very strong connections to the west. So. But it's definitely the, the St. potential is, is still yeah. there. But it's definitely okay. St. Petersburg is the window to the northwest. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there we agree. <laughs> the yes. And now I want uh, to introduce um, 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 another aspect. Yes, we have ten minutes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, ah, yeah. no, first, no, first, uh, yeah. just a second there. Um, uh, to, so now we usually also another northern asso association uh, in uh, when we speak about. Northern Association, when we speak about Russia, is Siberia. We sort of tend to associate the whole Siberia as the north, but Siberia, you know, it goes from the Arctic latitudes to much, uh, you know, more southern latitude. Yakutia or Saha Republic, uh, where uh, uh, Stepanida comes from, is exactly this vast piece of land uh, that goes across, you know, uh, along the Lena uh, River. And I want to ask you, uh, Stepanida, so you are you sing in the ethnic tradition of Toyuk, but at the same time, every time you perform, you experiment as an actress and as a singer. So how do you balance this? Uh, the need, not the need, but uh, so y y the way you p uh, preserve and uh, um, uh, transfer uh, the uh, uh, traditional singing with your um, experimentation. How much of the experiment and how much of the tradition you are putting into your singing, you personally? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
As it happens, uh, our apples uh, was uh, forgotten for 70 years, uh, and uh, we didn't talk about uh, we didn't talk much about it, and uh, no one sang in this Tayuk style. But since our childhood, we knew that the elders, uh, the old people, they sang in the villages. So, so my father was uh, like a storyteller and a singer. Yes. I, and, uh, but I didn't know him, and uh, so the first time I heard it from my grandma and my grandpa in the village when they sent it for me. <laughs> so that grandpa came in and he was uh, a little bit drunk. And it was the first time that I uh, could he uh, heard that how someone could sing and tell the story of their life. Uh, and grandma sang absolutely differently. Because it was like a woman, a woman singing. And she told her life story as well. And that's how it sort of uh, went into my head uh, uh, when I was a kid. So I started uh, singing once in a while, you know, laying in the hay, for example. Singing what I saw in uh, nine months of winter. So when, so when the spring comes and, and then the summer and sort of you sort of open your eyes and everything is great and because this is something that everybody has been waiting for so long time. So, and, uh, so there may be different songs, some of them uh, may uh, be songs of glory, some of them may be the songs of curse, and, uh, uh, but what I'm doing now is I'm uh, uh, teaching students uh, in order to establish uh, uh, a theater. And I'm trying to teach uh, those actors uh, to sing, even though sometimes they sing completely out of tune. <laughs> this is some, and this is the sound that you need to master in the first place. So just, the, just to teach them this takes a year, and they, sometimes they still cannot make it. I, I, I just wanted to suggest, shall we try, but when it takes a year, you know, I don't think we have 365 days to try. I went, to, I went to Ireland and I taught them this, and they really caught on very quickly, and they became good singers. Uh -huh. So basically, if we're talking about the differences, I like every person when they sing, they improvise. It depends on, on the mood you're in. Mm -hmm. 
пела песню. Mm. Вот это была такая трагическая песня. После этого меня все ругали. Ой, не хочу знаете, тяжело слушать. Mm. Mm. So, and there was one instance. Mm. Mm. There, there was one instance when uh, people were unhappy with me singing uh, when I saw a World War II song because there so there was there was a film and I made a song to the, to this film. And, uh, and because so many people were lost uh, in that war, so it was a very tragic song. And people were not happy with hearing me uh, singing that tragic song. So that was so obviously a cuckoo, a cuckoo bird song that they, you've seen in the spring. We are said we had one more um, um, participant in our the discussion, but we are really taken now out of the room. I almost have to apologize uh, um, for not giving the. So if it's it's really just one question, if you, if the other the next session will allow me, but it would be. Ah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have three minutes. Yeah, please. So Elena, Tit I wanted to ask Elena Titova, who is the director um, uh, of the um, Applied Arts in Moscow, um, the question that maybe we have. I need the help here, please. Um, the question yes. that uh, maybe we have already discussed, uh, since you, uh, your institution possesses rich collections of the yes. art yes. uh, of the uh, Arctic. I am here, uh, I'm here um, uh, for uh, art, for art collection of uh, all uh, Russia a decorative and applied art uh, museum. And uh, of course, uh, it's a quite long uh, presentation, but uh, I would like uh, to, um, you know, to to tell um, uh, another words. You will see some uh, history of the museum, some history of the uh, collecting, but better I will ask Boris to help me with it, uh, translating it. It will be quicker. And uh, I will tell about what, what we are doing now. So, museum in its uh, current form uh, was established 35 years ago. But our collection is 140 years old and it was established by Sergei Morozov. So 
And I believe that we have one of the most significant collections of uh, bone carvings uh, from different uh, Russian locations. So three major uh, bone carving centers are Hungarsk, Tobolsk, and uh, Chukotka. So and uh, so these bone carving centers uh, they continue to develop. They have a long history of 200 years. Uh, unfortunately, that's been slowed down a little bit. Uh, but in the middle of the 20th century, uh, they really they were really blooming those uh, bone carving centers. And uh, talking about our current activities, we continue uh, making expeditions to the areas. And those expeditions uh, include both uh, folklore and uh, researchers and ethnographers and students. And uh, in addition to uh, expanding our uh, collection with the new uh, artistic pieces, uh, we also uh, take things that are like uh, common things in households that are used traditionally. Even though uh, Moscow is not an Arctic city, but however, we do have Arctic collections or items that have come from the Arctic. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We are very sorry for the, uh, uh, the group that will follow us, but thank you very much for, all, for our panel uh, discussions and thank you very much for uh, uh, being with us. Um.